It's an exciting day. I hope you're excited to be here. I've asked Cassie to come and uh, paint for us again this morning. Usually, Brother Steve turns Cassie loose and says, hey, just paint whatever. I don't give Cassie that much freedom. I don't know if I trust her enough. Cassie, the only thing that I've asked you to do this morning is give me a lot of color. Can you do that? I want lots of color. I, I like color, so I'm asking her to paint with some, some color this morning. Uh, but it's an exciting day. I hope you're excited to be here. You know, today is a day that uh, I think it's about 900 years since a day like today has happened. I noticed this yesterday when I was writing out my message. Does anybody know anything special about today? Yeah, you can write the date forwards or backwards, and it's the same day. It's pretty cool. It's an exciting day, so I'm, I'm hoping you're excited to be here this morning. Freddie sent me a text last night saying uh, he was hoping that we were as excited to be at church this morning as we are about the Super Bowl that when I make my last point this morning, we're going to uh, dump Gatorade on me. So uh, Verlaine might, might not like that. She may, she may tell us no, but uh, I'm glad that you're here, and uh, hopefully we'll have a good time this morning. The, the sermon title this morning is about purpose, and it's we all have a ministry. We all have a ministry, but first I want to show you a couple of pictures of Ezra Thomas Jane, who was born January the 31st. First, weighing 6 pounds and 13 ounces and 21 inches long. So we have a couple pictures. Here's Brother Steve with uh, Ezra. Uh, so we're excited for them. And then uh, I think there's one even of Karen in there. So we're, we're really excited. They're in Charleston, South Carolina with uh, uh, their daughter and son-in-law who are there as they're in medical school. Of course, they have another one on the way. Clint's back there. They've got, got another grandchild on the way. So their family is, uh, is just really growing. So we... We rejoice with them. Uh, I want to start off this morning uh, telling you kind of a just kind of a lighter story. It's a, it's a John Maxwell story called The Meaning of Life. And I will tell you up front, it is not theologically correct. Okay, Brother Steve's gone this morning, so I'm going to tell a story that's not theologically correct. But it's called The Meaning of Life. And uh, on day one, God created the dog, which we know right there is not right. God created the dog, and when he created the dog, he said, I'm going to create you to bark at people all the days of your life. That's wh why you're created, and you're going to do this for 20 years. And the dog said, 20 years? That's a, that's a long time to bark at people. How about I give 10 of those years back, and then I'll do it for 10 years? And God said, okay, fair enough, bark at people for 10 years. And then on day two, he created the, the monkey. And he told the monkey, I'm going to create you to do tricks and make funny faces and make people laugh. And you're going to do this for 20 years. And the monkey said, man, that's a, that's a long time to make people laugh. How about I do it for 10 years and give 10 years back? And God said, okay, fair enough. And then on day three, God created the cow. And he said, I'm going to create you to go out and to work the fields with a farmer, to produce, to have calves, to produce milk, and to work all day. And you're going to do this for 60 years. And the cow said, man, that's a long time to, to, to work and to slave. How about I give you 40 years back and I do that for 20 years? God said, okay, go and work for 20 years. Then on day four, God created the man, the human. And he said, I'm going to create you and you're going to, uh, you're going to rest and relax and eat and be merry, just have a good time. And, and you're going to do this for, for 20 years. And the man said, man, 20 years? I'd like to do it longer than that. How about you give me back the 40 years that you took from the cow and, and the 10 years that you, got, you gave back to the monkey and the 10 years from the dog. And, and, and God said, okay, yeah, I can do that. And so that explains the meaning of life. The first 20 years of your life, you relax and you, you enjoy life and, and, you know, you eat. Some of you all see where this is going. The next 40 years, you're going to slave and you're going to work and you're going to take care of and provide for your family. Then the next 10 years, you're going to do monkey tricks for your grandchildren and in the last 10 years of your life, you're just going to sit on the front porch and bark at everybody that goes by. <laughs> That's the meaning of life. Life explained. You know, John Maxwell. I want to show you a picture this morning before I read my scripture. Uh, I'm going to be reading from Colossians chapter 1 in just a moment. If you want to be turning there, if you have your Bibles or your phone or whatever. Uh, uh, Colossians 1, 15 through 22 is going to be our focus scripture. But I want to show you a picture of Death Valley. Death Valley is the hottest place in the United States. It is dry. It is on the California-Nevada border. And I really want you to get this image in your mind. It's just basically no life there. Everything is dead because of the environment. Hot, dry, lifeless. And that's what it looks like, Death Valley. But in 
the autumn of 2015, something unusual happened in Death Valley where they got large amount, amounts of rain. Very unusual. And because of this rain and because of the environment change and it got the right condition, in February of 2015, I want to show you, show you what happened. There was these beautiful wildflowers that blossomed. Just a beautiful image of, of these yellow flowers. I think we have some pictures of some purple flowers. Just a beautiful image of, of what took place there in Death Valley. And the reason I want to show you those pictures and give those to you this morning is there may be places in your life that you think there's no life. There's, there's darkness. But the reason that these flowers sprouted is because there was seeds underneath the soil. But it just needed the right environment to sprout. And so my prayer this morning for this message is that we're getting that environment that we need through God's word and through his spirit. That if there's something in your life that needs to come alive, that God would speak to your heart this morning and he would bring it to life. Let's pray. Father, I thank you that you have brought us to church this morning. It is not by accident that we are here. And God, my prayer is that you're going to bring something that is dead to life, to life today. You're going to bring darkness to light. You're going to bring fear to freedom through your word, God. Your word is, is alive and powerful. And God, we ask that you would just open up our hearts, God, to receive your word this morning. And God, that you would speak to us. And it's in Jesus' name. Amen. Let us stand as we read God's word in Colossians chapter 1. Colossians chapter 1. I'm reading out of the NIV uh, version this morning just because I like the wording of it. But uh, right before verse 15, it says the supremacy of the Son of God. Now what's going on here? This is Paul writing this letter to the people of Colossians. And there had been this uh, destructive teaching that was going on in the life of the church there. They were trying to figure out who was Jesus. Who, who, is, who is this man called Jesus? Is he, is he a, an angel? Is he a, a prophet? Is he just another man or is he a son of God? So Paul is addressing this to these people and he says this. He, being Jesus, is the image of the invisible God. So you see Jesus, you see God. He said, the firstborn over all creation for by him all things were created, things in heaven and on earth, visible and invisible. Whether thrones or powers or rulers or authority, authorities, all things, everybody say all things, all things were created by him and for him. He is before all things, say all things, all things, and in him, say it together, all things hold together. And he is the head of the body, the church. He is the beginning and the firstborn from among the dead. So that in everything, he might have the supremacy. That's a good word right there, supremacy. For God was pleased to have in all his fullness dwell in him. And through him to reconcile himself to all things. Whether things on earth or things in heaven. By making peace through his blood shed on the cross. Now I really like verses 21 and 22. It says, once you were alienated from God and were enemies in your minds because of your evil behavior, but now he has reconciled you by Christ's physical body through death to present you holy in his sight without blemish and free, free from accusation. And this is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. You may be seated. We were at a ministry team at the beginning of January, and Brother Steve was letting us know that his, his daughter would be having a, uh, a baby soon, and that, that when that happened, if it just happened all of a sudden, that I needed to go ahead and get a sermon prepared, that I needed to be, be ready to preach. And, and I was thinking in the back of my mind, he doesn't understand how I operate. Because if you look at like procrastination in the dictionary, my, my, my face might be right there with it. Right, Troy? I see you back there. I mean, I learned that from Troy. Uh, you know, sometimes you just get things done when you, can, when you can get them done. But what was interesting about that is the very next day I'm at work, and of course working in the uh, 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 Adair County school system, you know, we have like 500 employees. I was with a co-worker, and they were telling me a story about God, and this person was a Christian. 
telling a story about God, and they said to me, I'm not a minister. But really what they were trying to say is that they weren't a preacher. But that really stuck with me, and I began to looking into that. But I believe, as Christians, that we all have a purpose. And when we talk about our purpose in life, it's so easy for our minds to go to what is our occupation. But our purpose in life is that we all have a ministry. As Christians, we all have a ministry. We are all ministers of the Gospels. We are all ambassadors for Christ. And that's really what I want to talk to this morning. And I think from this scripture, we can really get that. Now, I want to do a little teaching this morning. I want to do a little preaching. I want us to learn. I want us to be inspired. So I'm going to preach this morning. All right, so let's look through these verses, and then let's just really simplify it. So first in verse 15, it says, the image of the invisible God. So I already stated that if you see Jesus, you see God. And then we said the words, all things together, that all things were created in Jesus, and all things were created for Jesus. And that he, Jesus, is the head of the body of Christ. Jesus is the head of the church. Jesus is the head of this church, and hopefully Jesus is the head of your life. And then it used the word supremacy, that all supremacy, all authority belongs to Jesus. That he is the primary reason that we live. Our lives should be an encore to him, that our lives should bring glory to God because of what Jesus has done for us. Jesus is the one, in verse 20, that connects us to God. And then 21 through 22, it talks about how we were separated from God because of our sin, but because of Jesus' death, because of his blood, because of his resurrection, we are connected back to God, and we can live with freedom. Now, I'm the type of person that likes to keep things really simple. I like to, to put the cookies on the bottom shelf, put the cookie jar on the bottom shelf, so we, hey, it's, it's easy to understand. I, I'll be honest with you, I, I've been getting mad at Andrea lately because our ice machine in our refrigerator has quit working. And every time I go to get a drink out of the refrigerator, she takes the last drink out and then doesn't put any more drinks back in there. And I'm like, we don't have ice. It's, I'm going to have to put the drink in the refrigerator wait 30 minutes. And then she finally showed me one day. She said, you realize where you put the drinks? You put the case of water on top of the refrigerator and then you put the 12-pack of Diet Mountain Dew on top of that. She's like, I can't reach it. If I pull this down, it's going to hit me right in the face. And I'm like, okay. Maybe I need to put it down lower. So here's what I think this scripture is saying. It's really simple. Our ministry as Christians, why God created us is first and foremost that we know God. That's our ministry, that we know God. That being a Christian is not about just going down and, and praying a prayer at Bible school when you're young or having a point at a revival or wherever you accepted Christ and all of a sudden you're a Christian. That is the starting point. If a runner is going to run in a race and the, 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 uh, whatever goes off, they shoot the horn or whatever, and the, and the runner takes off sprinting and then just stops, he's not going to win the race. The starting point is when we put our belief in Jesus, that we believe in our heart and we confess with our mouth that Jesus is Lord. But from then on, the rest of our life, our ministry is to know God, daily know God. And then from there, we are to make God known. That's our ministry as Christians, to know God and to make God known. Real simple. To know God and to make not God known. To know Jesus and to make Jesus known. That when people see you, they see God. When people see you, they see Jesus. Or maybe a better way, when people see you, they see a glimpse of God. When people see you, they see a glimpse of, glimpse of Jesus. Now you may be saying, that's, that's too easy. That's like, that's just too easy. I, I, I want to know more. I want to know I want to know which job I'm supposed to take. That's my purpose. I, I want to know which person I'm supposed to marry. Am I supposed to date this girl or that girl? I want to know which go college I'm supposed to go to. Am I supposed to go to UK or Lindsey Wilson College? Am I supposed to be a wildcat? Go Cats! I thought I'd get an amen there. I was, that was my goal today is to get one amen today. I knew I'd get it. Right? Go Cats or am I going to be a Blue Raider? If you're my child, you're going to probably be a Blue Raider. I'm going to pull you. No, I'm just kidding. Uh, but what am I supposed to do? So let's say God writes you a letter and says, go to University of Kentucky, become a wildcat. And you go to UK and you get a degree and you go and get your master's and then you find the perfect person and you, you marry them and you get this awesome job and you have two and a half kids and you get a house and a dog and all this stuff. Then what? Then where are you at? You're still supposed to know God. You're still, still supposed to live in a way to make God known. 
that is our purpose, is to knowing God. And here's what I believe. I believe that God has each and every one of you in a certain place in your life, a certain platform, and it's that you use that platform to make God known. That you, if you're in business, that you use your business to make God known. If you're in education, you educate in a way to, to make God known. If you work in a factory, you work in that factory to make God known. If you're in the medical field, you serve your patients so people can know God. If you're a farmer, which takes a lot of faith, through that faith, you make God known. I'll be honest with you. This Bible that I'm reading from this morning is actually, uh, I don't know if you remember this, uh, uh, Paul, is Paula not here? Uh, James, but Kayla actually took this Bible. I, I got this Bible when I was in college, and man, I, I went on a mission trip, and a guy gave me this, and I just fell in love, and it started falling apart because it's not a hardback, and Kayla took it, and she put duct tape on it for me and made it kind of brought it back to life, but, but I remember when I got this Bible, I just fell in love with this Bible and with the Word and what it said, and I even began to question where God had placed me in my life. I was, I was a sophomore in college. I was playing college basketball, which took about six hours of my day, and I got to thinking, Man, I just want to know God, and I want people to know God. I think I need to quit playing basketball. And God spoke to me in that moment and said, No, I want you to use where you are right now. I want you to use basketball to make me know. So I say that this morning because I believe that God wants you to use you where, you're, where you are in your life to make God known. So many times we want to focus on so many other things. Maybe it's riches. Well, the Bible says in Proverbs 23, 5, Cast but a glance at riches, and they are gone. That we want to live in a way that we make God known, that that's going to live on even after we're gone. That it's everlasting. And I'll be honest with you, as I'm talking about that you're supposed to make God known, it may be creating some anxiety in some of you all. Thinking, there is no way that I can add another thing to my life. I can't do a ministry to make God known. I'll be honest with you, there is nowhere in the Bible that says we should be busy. I don't say that. It says we, we're to be fruitful. And I think one of the things that Satan always tells our students, we're not fearful of Satan, but we're aware of Satan. We, we know Satan's plans, right? He wants to steal, kill, and destroy. We're aware of that, but we're not fearful. And we have to be aware that maybe Satan just tries to get us to be busy. That maybe he tries to get us to think, hey, if we're not busy, we're not important. And so sometimes when you think, if I have to add something else to my schedule, there's just no way. No, I'm saying, if you, if you read in the, the book of Matthew where it talks about making disciples, which is making God known, Brother Steve kind of taught me this. And he taught me, I don't remember if it was like the Greek or the uh, Hebrew. I struggle with English, for those of you who know me, so I can't get into all those other languages, right? But he taught me that scripture about making disciples, that it's really the way that the heart of the way that message was written is as you go, make disciples. So as you serve God where you're at, whether in your place of work, with your family, wherever, that you make God know. And I'll be honest with you, for, for us parents, and I'm talking to the 6'8 guy with two thumbs, this guy right here, I'm, I'm talking to me as well about being busy and about our, our children as parents. It is our job as parents to make God known to our children. We are the primary person to make Jesus known to our children. It's our responsibility as parents. It's not that it, the church is a resource, absolutely. But we as parents have to make God known. We had this conversation Sunday night in small group, and I'll be honest with you, I, I wasn't enjoying the conversation a whole lot. I, I'm just going to be real with you all this morning. I have failed at that in 2020, of really helping my five-year-old, more so than my 10-month-old, of, of helping make God, God known to him. One of the things that, that's changed in our life uh, in 2020 is for Christmas in 2019, my son got this, uh, this gaming system called a Nintendo Switch. And he has this game called NBA 2K. And you know what we usually do every night? Instead of having our devotion like we used to last year, we play a, a basketball game. Now, that's right. Like, you should spend time with your children and do things with them. But the most important thing we can do for our children is to make God known and spend time with them in God's Word and in God's prayer. And I'm so thankful. We had that conversation last Sunday night. Uh, and so you may, you may have other thoughts in your mind, like why you can't make God known. It, it may be... Who knows what? One of the things that I think of that, that people say, well, I, I can't live in a way to make God known because of my past. You don't know what I've done in my past. Well, I'm, I'm quickly reminded of Acts uh, 13, 36. It says this. Now, when David had served God's purpose, his ministry in his own generation, he fell asleep. He, he died and he, he was buried. There's a lot in that scripture. But first of all, David? David, a man who who committed adultery and then tried to cover it up, and then because he couldn't cover it up, had somebody murdered? Really? Yes. 
because he had remorse. He had forgiveness of his, of his sins. And God used him. So the question this morning, in this generation, are you going to fulfill your ministry? Are you going to fulfill your purpose? But we can't just go with David. Look at Noah. Noah saved the entire universe through the flood, and then afterwards he went and got drunk and got naked in front of his family. You can look at Abraham. He slept with his servant to, because he didn't want to wait on the Lord. You can look at Moses who killed another Egyptian who was attacking an Israelite, which is kind of interesting because eventually that was God's calling on Moses' life to deliver the Israelites. Peter, who was the rock, he was the lead disciple, denied Jesus three times. And even Paul, who wrote this letter, had Christians killed. So I have a word for you this morning. If you say that God can't use you for your past, the word is horse garbage. Because look at all the people that he used and the terrible things that they did. There is forgiveness of sins, and God can use us. And what we are called to do is to know God and to make God known. So we can't look at our, our past. We can't look at our past. What about, you think, well, I'm not really important to God. God doesn't see me. I'm a nobody. The Bible says he knows the number of hairs on your head. Or for Freddie and Buddy, the lack thereof, right? Okay, sorry, buddy. But God cares about you. God knows you. God knows you exist. I, I heard a story this week about... You know, when you go to these public bathrooms now, they have these uh, sensors where you like wash, you know, that you have to, get, you have to pick up you know, the, mo the, the motion of your hands. Has anybody ever like done that and been like, <laughs> I mean, has anybody experienced like, come on, water, right? Well, I was reading a story, you know, you get this woman, she, she went and washed her hands and she goes over to this paper towel dispenser and it's actually, the picture is actually a forearm. But she thinks it's a person waving at her. So she's waving at this paper towel dispenser. And it doesn't see her, right? And she keeps waving. And finally she gets frustrated and she just walks away, just the water dripping off her hands. And then the person that comes up behind her, you know, because you don't want to touch something. You've already washed your hands. You know, we figured this out. And so I guess this is before the motions came along. And so the lady behind her went up and went with the forearm. And, and, you know, right there comes the paper towels out, and she grabs the paper towels, right? But sometimes we feel like that, right? We feel like nobody sees us, that nobody hears us, that we don't matter, that we're not important. And I think what we have to do is we have to look into God's Word and see what He says who we are and what He says about our life. And I don't think we can really talk about our purpose in life and the plans that God has for us without leaving out Jeremiah chapter 29. And as I tell you that chapter, you immediately probably think of Jeremiah 29, 11, which is a very well-known passage of Scripture. But in Jeremiah 29, chapter 11, I actually want to read down to verse 14. But it starts off saying, For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord. Plans to, to prosper you and not to harm you. Plans to give you a, a hope and a future. It's a beautiful verse. God has good plans for us. And in verse 12 says, Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will listen to you. The Bible says if we come to God and we pray, he listens. Why? Because we're important to God. He sees us. And then in verse 13, it says, you will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord. What we're called to do as Christians is to seek God with all of our heart. To seek God with all of our heart. No, I need some color, Cassie. That is, <laughs> that is green and brown. I need color. 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 You never know where you get. Oh, just keep my mouth. Todd, I'll pray for. I'll pray for you, Todd. Where she go? I didn't plan this part out. I'll just be honest with you. 
This was not part of the sermon. Uh, where do I go from here? Y'all think I'm lying. I didn't plan this out. I'm staying here for a while. Todd, you got anything? There we go. Bring Todd up here to preach. <laughs> we need to take a time out. It's it's the Super Bowl today. All right. But that scripture talks about how we have to seek God with all of our heart. That's what we're called to do. We're called to know God and to make Him known. And if you want to know the the true meaning of life, it's not about just going around and having a good time. It's not not about just relaxing and, and eating good food. That is part of God's plan for our life. I mean, God was so big about that that he created a Sabbath day for us to rest. So that is very important in the Christian life. And the Bible says about eating, whatever you eat or whatever you drink, you do it for the glory of God. So that is a, an important part of life, but it's not the meaning of life. The meaning of life is not about getting rich. We are called from the very beginning of the Bible in the book of Genesis to work. That's We were created to work. We, we were created to, to do good work. The Bible says, whatever you do, do it for the glory of the Lord. So absolutely, yes, we are to work and we're to provide and we're to take care of our families. Absolutely, 100%. And if you look in the book of Proverbs, it talks about laughter, how it's good for the heart. There are, t- there are times in our life that, that we make people laugh, that we tell jokes, that we, we do uh, monkey tricks with our grandchildren or our children. That is a part of life, but it's not the meaning of life. It's not the meaning of life. And there are times, unfortunately, that we might have to bark at a dog to someone. We may have to get up in someone's face in a loving way and share the truth with them because God is about truth. God is about justice. And so there are different aspects of our life that we go through. But the most important thing as Christians that that we want to do is we want to know God. And we want to make God known. And we all have seeds of greatness within us. As believers, we have seeds, we have things that are just waiting, that God is waiting to bring to life. But it's all about knowing God and allowing Him to speak to our hearts and that we seek Him, like Jeremiah says. That we seek God and He wants to do something beautiful in our life. God wants to bring transformation. The Bible says in Romans to be transformed. And He wants to take us from a cocoon to something way more beautiful. He wants to take us to a butterfly. He wants to add color to our life. But it's all about making God known. But before you can make Him known, you've got to know.